So the first chapter, um, which is included in Rogers Brubaker's Ethnicity Without Groups, uh, that I want to read through with you and try to briefly summarize, is the chapter called Beyond Identity. Now, the version which actually I will be reading through with you, uh, there are two versions. One is there's a chapter in this book. So this is chapter two in his book, Ethnicity Without Groups. And the second is uh, a version which is published in a journal, Theory and Society, and it was published in 2000. And so what I'm going to be doing is um, I'm going to be reading through with you, trying to point out for me uh, what are the most important points that Rogers Brubaker and Frederick Cooper make about the problems with always talking about identity, about where this word came from, and about the problems that we had, we have with it, its weaknesses. And often it's a common thing that, um, yeah, as we know, uh, there are tools uh, that we come across in the marketplace. There are tools that we used to use when we built things. And at the time when we first started to use them, they were amazing and they were the only way to get a job done. But as things change and technology changes, new tools become available that allow us to do a job faster, easier, more accurately. So uh, new tools that we see being used when we construct new buildings, they are more sophisticated, they are more accurate, they are sharper, they are faster, they are easier to use. And what is true for physical, ordinary tools is also true for the conceptual tools that we use when we do our work um, in the social sciences. And so uh, Rogers uh, Brubaker begins um, his chapter, um, uh, Beyond Identity, uh, talking about the problems with words. He has the argument in this article, and let's we can go to full screen now. Uh, the problem, the argument of this article is that the social sciences has surrendered to the word identity, that it has been both that it that this has both intellectual and political costs, and that we can do better. Identity tends to mean too much and too little, or nothing at all. Uh, they take stock of the conceptual and theoretical work of identity, what it's supposed to do, and suggest that this work can be better done with other terms. So Cooper and Brubakers, uh, they argue that the prevailing constructivist stance on identity, and I am a constructivist, that the con prominent stance on identity, the attempt to soften the term, to equate it, um, of, uh, to acquit it of the charge of essentialism by stipulating that identity is a constructed, fluid, multiple, leaves us without a rationale for talking about identities at all and ill-equipped to examine the hard dynamics and essentialist claims of the of contemporary identity politics. If identity is everywhere, it is nowhere. If it is fluid, how can we understand the ways in which self-understandings may be hardened, congeal, or crystallize? Identity is a key term in the vernacular idiom of contemporary politics. Conceptualizing all affinities, affiliations, all forms of belonging, all experiences of commonality, connectedness, cohesion, 
all self-understandings and self-identifications in the idiom of identity, it straddles us with a blunt, flat, undifferentiated vocabulary. We need new conceptual tools. We need more words to talk about our world. So they focus on identity as an analytical category. Uh, the use and abuses of identity affects not only the language of social analysis, but its substance. Social analysis requires relatively unambiguous analytical categories. And they say that identity is far too ambiguous. The introduction of identity into social analysis and its initial diffusion into the social sciences occurred in America in the 1960s. And in, in, in the second, actually from the second half of the 1950s, and a number of scholars are mentioned by Brew Bakers. For a variety of reasons, the term identity proved uh, resonant in the 60s, diffusing quickly across disciplinary boundaries, establishing itself in the journalistic and academic vocabulary or lexicon, and permeating the use of social and political practice, as well as that of social and political analysis. And there are a number of things that happened in the United States in the 1960s, the Black Power Movement, other ethnic movements. Um, um, unlike Europe, which had more leftist class-based politics in the United States, it was racial and ethnic politics which was most important. Our point is that the weakness of class politics in the United States left the field particularly wide open for the profusion of identity claims. He goes on, in the 1980s, with the rise of race, class and gender as the holy trinity of literary criticism and cultural studies, the humanities joined um, uh, in full force an identity talk continues to proliferate today. So the term identity is very, very common. Categories of practice and analysis. Sorry, let me just go a bit slower. Many key terms in the interpretive social sciences and history, race, nation, ethnicity, citizenship, democracy, class, community, tradition, for example, are at once categories of social and political practice and categories of social and political analysis. By practice, they mean um, calling it native folk or lay categories. These are categories of everyday social experience. Identity is both a category of practice and a category of analysis. As a category of practice, it is used by ordinary actors um, in some everyday settings to make themselves make sense of themselves and their activities. So this is one of the ways that identity is worked. But everyday identity talk and identity politics are real and important phenomenon, but the contemporary salience of identity as a category of practice does not require its use as a category of analysis. Reification is a social process, not only an intellectual one. As such, reification is central to the politics of ethnicity, race, nation, and other punitive identities. Analysis of this kind of politics should seek to account for this process of reification. We should seek to explain the processes through which these have been called the political fiction of the nation or the group. So that is the issue of reification of ideas. So this is an important argument. It may be objected from this out. It may be objected 
that this overlooks recent efforts to avoid reifying identity by theorizing identities as multiple, fragmented, and fluid. Essentialism has indeed been vigorously criticized and constructivist gestures now occupy most discussions of identity. Yet we often find that an uneasy amalgam of constructivist language and essentialist argumentation. This is not a matter of intellectual sloppiness. Rather, it affects, it reflects the dual orientation of many academic um, uh, people interested in identity as both analysts and protagonists of identity politics. On the uses of identity, there are a number of criticisms. It is hopelessly ambiguous. And so here are some, well, how do scholars mean when they talk about identity? What work do they want to do with it? It depends on the context of its use and the theoretical tradition. The, the term is richly um, ambiguous, uh, but one can identify several uses. Understood as a grounds or basis of social or political action, identity is often opposed to interest in an effort to highlight and conceptualize non-instrumental modes of social and political action. Strands of identity theorizing see social and political action as powerfully shaped by position and social faith. Identity is also understood as a specifically collective phenomenon. Identity denotes a fundamental and a consequential sameness amongst members of a group or category. Thirdly, uh, identity is understood as a core aspect of individual um, of individual or collective selfhood or as a fundamental condition of social being. Identity is invoked to point to something allegedly deep, basic, abiding and fundamental. Fourthly, I, I Identity is understood as a product of social and political action. Identity is in, in, invoked to highlight the processual interactive development of the kind of collective self-understanding, solidarity or groupness that can, that can make collective action possible. Fifthly, identity is understood as an effervescent product of multiple and competing discourses. Identity is involved to invoke to highlight the unstable, multiple, fluctuating and fragmented nature of the contemporary self. So Brubakers and Cooper, they point out clearly the term identity is made to do a great deal of work. Um, these usages are not simply heterogeneous, diverse, they point in sharply differing directions. Identity bears a multivariant, even contradictory, theoretical burden. Do we really need this heavily burdened, deeply ambiguous term? Critical discussion of identity has thus sought to jettison uh, not to jettison, but to save the term by reformulating it so to make it immune from certain objections, especially from the dreaded charge of essentialism, or I might add primordialism. We are not, whoops, sorry, let's just go back up. We read, we are not, sorry, we are not persuaded. Let me do that again. We are not persuaded that identity is indispensable. We sketched below some alternative analytical tools and um, if one wants to examine the meaning and significance people give to constructs such as race and ethnicity and nationality, one already has to tread through conceptual thickets 
and it is not clear what one gains by aggregating or joining them under the flattened rubric of identity. And so clearly there is a problem. There are weak and strong understandings of identity. So um, they suggested that identity either means too much or too little. Strong conceptions of identity um, preserve the common sense meaning of the term, the emphasis on sameness over time or across persons. Identity is something all people have, all people possess. Identity is something that all groups have or ought to have. So all people, all groups. Identity is something people and groups can have without being aware of. It is subconscious. In this perspective, identity is something uh, to be discovered, perhaps, even mistaken. Strong notions of collective identity simply imply strong notions of group bondedness and homogeneity. They assume these things. Given the powerful challenges from many quarters to substantialist understandings of groups and essentialist understandings of identity, one might think we have sketched a straw man here, yet, in fact, strong conceptions of identity continue to inform important strands of the literature on gender, race, ethnicity and nationalism. Yet this new theoretical common sense has problems and the problems, uh, there are three of them, and we'll just emphasise the following points made. The first is that um, Rogers and Cooper, the Brubakers and, and Cooper, they say um, they, the first problem is what they called cliché constructivism. Weak or soft conceptions of identity are routinely packaged with standard qualifiers indicated that identity is multiple, unstable, in flux, contingent, fluctuating, constructed, negotiated, and so on. These qualifiers have become so familiar in recent years that one reads or writes them virtually automatically. They risk becoming mere placeholders, gestures singling a stance rather than words conveying a meaning. Second, it is not clear why weak conceptions of identity are conceptions of identity. The everyday use of identity suggests at least some self-awareness over time, something that remains identical, the same, while other things are changing. Third, and most importantly, Weak conceptions of identity may be too weak to do the theoretical work that they want to. What is interesting and important in this work in this work often does not depend on the use of identity of as an analytical category. So he provides a number of examples, and we're not going to go into those, except to say that including uh, he mentions that Charles Tilley in a collection, uh, uh, categorise identity as a blurred but indispensable concept and defined it as an actor's experience of a category, tie, role, network, group or organisation coupled with a public representation of that experience. The public representation often takes the form of a shared story or a na narrative. So Tilly rounds up the usual suspects of race, gender, class, job, religious affiliation, national origin. And um, he goes on, just well, justly well known for fashioning sharply focused hard-working concepts, Tilly here faces the difficulty that confronts most social scientists writing about identity today that of devising a concept soft and flexible enough to satisfy the requirements of a relational, constructive or social theory, yet robust enough to make purchase on the to have purchase on the phenomena that cry out for explanation, uh, some of which is quite hard. And so 
um, let's, um, let's pause now and then in the second part we're going to be talking about some of the alternatives that um, Brew Bakers and Cooper suggest that we can use instead of talking about identity.